we are speaking about software entrepreneurship. Um, this is a, a topic actually pretty dear to my heart. Go back decades. Um, uh, I've been involved uh, since the 80s and on the commercial sector. Um, and I was a central partner, really a founding partner in three successful startups, um, uh, several of which are still in operation. Um, and, uh, and some of which I, I actually pursued in parallel with, with academic duties in the, in the mid 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I run a consulting company still um, for, for my own consulting around the world. And uh, I have very active involvement in a couple of startups, um, US, Canadian, uh, startups uh, that uh, have different business models and are uh, focused on, on different markets. And uh, I was quite involved in the startup ecosystems over the decades, uh, both here in Saskatchewan and in the US. Um, and this has given me a certain perspective. Um, I've witnessed very closely success and I've witnessed the agony of defeat and and uh, and pathologies, failure modes by which startups can uh, that have the best ideas can go off base um, and off the rails and and be derailed. Um, so I'm commenting here on the basis of 25 years, quarter century, doing this sort of work, um, getting close to 30 years now. Um, but I want to want to highlight the fact that you know there are some people far more experienced than I. And some of my former colleagues, the, the former president of one of the, the first startups that I, I helped co-found, um, you know, are, are just gurus in this area, run large entrepreneurship centers, et cetera. And while I still stay in touch with those people, they have, you know, a lot more insight and understanding than I do of a lot of pieces of this and, and I'm better connected. But, you know, I'm a software engineer. I do software development. And uh, a lot of people come at this, say, from the business side. They come at it from the finance side or the marketing side or, or HR side. And there's an importance of perspective from the software side, technical side as well. And I like to think I, I bring that along. Now, my talk, therefore, this discussion, which is going to go into Thursday in our you know, final, final lecture together, is going to focus on a particular area of entrepreneurship. You can talk about entrepreneurship at large, and, and there's some commonalities across areas. You do a, um, a startup in the construction area, or a startup in the biotech area, or a startup in the environmental engineering area, or not. Hardware area, computer hardware or software. There's going to be some similarity between them. And if you go to Edwards School of Business and talk about startups and their entrepreneurship um, uh, promoting activities, you'll learn a lot about that. But that's not what this is about specifically. I'm not trying to address the broad breadth. I'm trying to address the particular needs of software startups. Software startups have very particular features that 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 lengthen they they have differences from starting a big biotech company which needs sir tank reactors and big capital investment a software startup is different it's different than making pcbs and circuit boards and you know uh wicked fast hardware for maximum um software startups have low capital investment typically low overhead associated with them, um, can have high growth in parking markets. We'll talk about the business models and how that, that differs in terms of this. Um, uh, and you do have actually a choice of business models. Um, consulting, uh, can do you know, mass, mass marketing uh, of, of software. You can have uh, software as a service. You could be focused on semi-custom software. There's all these different business 
models by which you can do really well in software. And they're very different. And they have different architectural needs, technical underpinnings on different growth curves, um, different types of rewards. So distinctive software. And it's quite different from you know doing an agricultural startup, for example. Um, there's rapidly evolving technologies here. Every few years, you know, the languages evolve markedly, the frameworks we use. It wasn't too long ago. Angular 2 was the big thing. And now, you know, um, it, it, it then got supplanted by Angular 3 and React kind of um, took over a lot of its uh, its uh, market share. And and these days, you know, the technologies are evolving, uh, evolving quickly on multiple fronts. Um, there is a lot of unfilled market niches, you know, you're on your your imagination, networking, um, uh, understanding of market needs is is often the greater limit than than strictly money or, or capabilities. And there are few visible constraints. And there's you know a mythology and romance that dates back to the seventies and eighties of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, you know, setting up setting up firms in their proverbial garages and making buildings. And you know, I know some of those people have made books um, in that sphere. Um, you know, it's a lot of draws here, um, turning ideas into practical reality, you know, working with friends and, and having a blast, uh, establishing a corporate culture, leaving one's mark. Um, lots and lots of reasons people are drawn to this. But there's a lot of challenges. And these challenges are just not as obvious as the draws. I'm going to shut the door here, please. I want everyone to have the Okay. Um, so the barriers aren't as obvious as the draws. And for many of these barriers, you know, there's war stories behind it that I can tell. And if anyone's interested in really, you know, engaging with me about this, I'd be glad to, to talk, you know, outside class time about, about some of these uh, in more detail. Um, these are common challenges. If I wanted to go and, and finish all the slides I've prepared for you, I'd only spend one or maybe two minutes on this slide. I'm gonna actually spend a lot more consciously because this slide is actually, I think one of the more important ones in enumerating some of the lessons that I've learned over the years. Some of the things that can go wrong, some of the anti -tubs. And I want to just get them out to you because when I was starting out in the entrepreneurship idea, when I did my first consulting in 91 or 9, probably before many of you were born, um, you know, I, um, I wish I had known these things. Wish someone could have just given me this list and saying, watch out for these and talk through. I could have spared myself a lot of trouble. Partner tensions. The rest is, there was a um, statistic that was given to me at one point um, in the MIT Entrepreneurship Club. 40% of MIT startups, I heard, failed because of partner trust. 14% partners fell apart. Now, that was some years ago. I don't know if that statistic still holds. But tensions between partners, founding partners, can surface in market ways. I've lost best friends in this way. I've had close academic colleagues who have founded startups and have lost close friends in this way as well. Um, I've seen I've seen very tight knit companies working together where the different sides of it come apart at the seams and where lawsuits are formed. And it's a sad but true thing. But this, these aren't bolts out of the blue. These aren't you know chance events that you just can't anticipate. You can help head them off. You can make them less likely, and you can make them less serious if they do come up in more collegial and, and things that can be worked out with the right mechanisms. These include legal mechanisms. It includes the things we derive as paperwork. 
But if you attend to them early, you can actually have a lot of partner problems solved, or at least at least make them a lot less damaging and a lot less likely to, to fracture the company as well as fractures. Another challenge is really pinning down the business model. Um, when you're starting a, a software project, the sky's the limit. You know, you get all sorts of ideas and stars go through your heads about the possibility. And often it's hard to go from that stage to, you know, really pin down, okay, how exactly are we going to have our flows of money? Where exactly is it going to come from? And there's many reasons, as we'll talk about in this balancing stage, why early on you say, well, you know, we don't want to pin that down yet. Let's let's learn from the market. Let's observe this. Let's try that. Um, and where you don't pin down this business model. But to sell the company to investors, to, to get investments from others, and for sort of clarity on where to put your efforts, often you want to put some, some real effort into this business model side. And there are people who specialize in that, who, who have the background to really drive that side. They need to respect them. They may not be technical, but they have a, a clear understanding of, of the economic symbol, the microeconomic symbol. Another big challenge for many of these companies, not all, is finding the first client. This is much more of an issue for semi-custom and custom type of companies. Um, companies that you know sell product or service rather than you know putting an app out that's used by the mass market. Mass market stuff, you put an app on the Apple Store and, and the Play Store for Android. Um, you're not desperately worried about finding your first client. But if what you've done is build a sizable, minimal viable product, and it's taken you hundreds of hours of work, and you want to recoup those costs, you've got to find your first client who will make use of it. Or if you have a service, and it's a pretty high ticket service, maybe tens of thousands of dollars a year you're offering, um, you want to find your first client to take advantage of it. So finding a, a first client is often cheap, and, and they'll often let you understand better what the needs are out there. They they can serve to to recommend your system to others. They can be the one who works with you to extend it, or you know at least pays you back from the development time you put in. And this is often that desperate search that goes on early on for many, many startups, finding that first client that's not too off base, it's along the lines of what you're seeking and they can champion your product or at least um, highlight its potential. And you can say to others who might consider buying it, look, we've sold it already to TD Canada Trust or we've sold it to Nutrient or we've sold it to, you know, SCD or what have you. Um, Another challenge comes in and has technical components is you know aligning an architecture like a technical architecture you have in the business model because the business model you use the pricing schemes that you use the metering schemes for how much you charge people are actually linked in with the architecture and there's some very interesting works that that have to do with kind of linking these two up the architectures that enable a business model that enable billing the customer in a certain way based on use. It, it enables the sort of metering that, that figures out how much they're using it and what they're using in a way you could charge for it according to how much they're using. Another challenge is incentive alignment. Um, and aligning, aligning things so that the partners and the customers and the suppliers all have sort of a, a alignment that makes things work really well. Um, that, that's kind of a high level idea, but the idea is you wanna incentivize people to use more of it. You wanna incentivize the customers to make good use of it, to, to extend their use of it, to purchase more or to use it seriously. And there are certain types of models like subscription models that do exactly that that companies have gravitated to. Back when I was your age, the big companies, be they Lotus Development Corp or Microsoft or Oracle or what have you, 
would charge um, per seat licenses or maybe per seat, um, you know, per per um, uh, per system shift, um, uh, say for a software package, say Microsoft Office. These days, a lot of it shifted towards subscription models to align the incentives, to align people to, if they're going to get it for a year, they want to use it a lot. And it kind of gets them to invest in more. Um, whereas paying per disk shift doesn't really um, align that incentive quite as well. Um, crossing a credibility gap with potential customers is a big need. Showing you're a real player and you can compete with other companies. Uh, effective risk management, finding uh, senior people. Now, I want to talk about a few of these things, though. What is this balancing? This is a really big thing for, for small companies. A lot, I mean, I'd say most small startups go through balancing along most, most of these fronts here. And I've listed them in 50 ways, and I want to walk through them. Number one, this idea of, okay, you want to do X. If you have an idea for a product or a service, and you want to roll it out, and it's going to do X. But maybe to get investment or get customers, early customers, early clients, they have different ideas. They want you to do this instead. They want you to do something kind of similar, but it's not really what you had in mind. Or they want you to do something extra or something, you know, apply it to a different area. And there's always this challenge. And I've seen it in startup after startup after startup. Do we stay true to our original vision in the hopes of eventually finding a client and a um, uh, potential, you know, user match who will, who will make use of our original focus on um, investors who like that? Or do we go into a different area. Um, I remember seeing this in the 90s for the first time, and it struck me as really interesting. One of my first consulting gigs, I was um, I was a compiler hacker at the time, right? Like language designer and language engineer um, did compilers, and I was uh, invited out to a startup that was um, creating a new language, and they wanted advice for me on engineering the mechanisms to make their language performance scalable, et cetera. So I went out and, and I gave them a bunch of results. It was a really neat language, full language. It had been a couple of years in the thinking and um, there were some great ideas. And I gave them some advice. And they, when I was there, they said, yeah, you know, we're, um, we're really excited about rolling up this language, but, you know, we, we got to get we're, we're running short of cash and we need some money in. So we're going to, we, we have this other product that's not a language product. It, it's actually a set of libraries for um, sort of security related issues and, and, uh, and performance on servers. And uh, we're thinking we'll sell that alongside the language. And we'll get early money in through this or customers for this and we can get the language out. In the medium term, um, and you know, sell the, the, the compiler that I was guiding them on. Guess what? 20 years later, they never got out the language. That, that was the whole reason for the company. The whole company name was named after the language they were going to sell. And they ended up selling this solution for security and garbage collection on servers because the market took off. They were popular for that, people invested on that side. The language never saw the light of day. It was the whole reason they founded the company. So they, they had a vision. It was a compelling vision. They were really excited about it. It never came about. What came about was something very different. Was it a successful company? Yeah, I've got bought by some impact and became a, you know, they probably got tens of millions of dollars each for the investment and financially was it successful? Yes. Is this why they had dropped out of school to find the create a garbage collection library and security library? No, that wasn't the technical vision that animated them. But what actually came about, what actually earned them tens of millions was something very different. It's a constant challenge. 
you have a vision, do you stay true to it at the cost of sacrificing opportunities right now, or do you go for wherever those opportunities are? Too much going just for the opportunity, so like a, just a flag waving in the wind, whatever, whatever client you speak to, you say, yeah, we'll do that for you, and you lose track of, of your core areas of contribution, your core areas of what passion you have. On the other hand, you stick too much to the focus, and you go under or can't survive. This is the trade-off, or you can't get investment. You can't get investors to to buy into your story. It's not a concept. Another thing is, you know, you, you have a vision for a product. Maybe you are sticking true to it, but it kind of in your mind it kind of goes together. It's just a beautiful vision. It all comes together in this beautiful way, and you want to get that out there, but. There's this need to get out a minimal viable product. Get something minimalist to market. Why? Because that's where you learn from the market, right? You get something to market and you really learn what the market needs with much greater clarity. It's all idea of minimal viable product. And you hit the market sooner so you can learn sooner about what the real needs of the market are. And some people feel well, you know. This minimal viable product doesn't have half the value, doesn't have a quarter of the value of the full vision. It would take us just three months longer to put in the full vision, but others will say, no, look, you're, you know, you're blowing smoke. You, you don't really know what the market needs. Listen to the market, get the MVP out there. That tends to be the word on the street. That tends to be um, sort of what people recommend who are most in the know is try something, fail forward, fail early, fail off. Get an MVP out there and learn from it. This is this whole philosophy of, you know, failing forward. You, you try something and you learn from it. I was just on Twitter the other day and, you know, someone was saying, look, um, actually my old, my first president, my, my first startup, um, uh, he forwarded a tweet. Or someone said, and I have to apologize for the language, but I'll I'll say what they said. They said, "Look, just go start a shitty startup. Like, go start a shitty startup, and you'll learn, and you'll learn how to do a good startup because you'll learn from your mistakes and so on. Do it sooner rather than sort of sitting back and and pondering, you know, how to do it perfectly." Get the experience, get the feedback from the market, learn from doing. That's what they were recommending. And there's some truth to that. That is the idea of fail early, fail often, fail forward. Fail in a way that helps you learn. Um, you know, financing and control, this, this becomes a larger issue when you're raising money. Um, I'm associated with some startups who have successfully raised money on, on the Bay Area in the States, which is famous for software venture capital. I, am, I know others pursuing that right now. And that comes with loss of control. They, they'll invest equity in you. So they'll say, yeah, we'll take 20% of your company. Um, uh, and in return, we'll give you, you know, 750K. Um, and uh, if you take that far enough, maybe you get a million dollars from them, and they'll take half your company, and then they'll start telling you what, where, where you should be putting your efforts more, and who you should let go, who you should keep, and they'll say, "This is your new boss." By the way, they're gonna they're gonna run it. They have lots of experience. Been there, done that. Seen people appointing to the company who I didn't particularly like working with, etc. Um, you know, balancing overwork and hard work, not, not burning out, but still really pushing for things. The risk and return are always an issue, you know, to what degree do you risk going for your focus and, or to what degree do you follow the money right now at the cost of, of losing, losing that, that vision. Uh, and then sort of growth and stability. This is an issue when companies get large enough. Um, you know, I, I work with some companies that have gotten into the larger range. And once you're in the tens of million dollar range and you're growing by 50% a year, you know, you have, next year you have another half again as many employees as you had. You had 100 this year, 150 the next year. 
I was at Microsoft for the website scale. I was, I was there in the first 200 people. Or so. And um, it was going like crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, there's great opportunities there, but sometimes you find it grows so fast, you can't manage it effectively. You know, no one's been there for more than a few months. They don't know how things are done and, and how to, you know, who to go to about issues. Everything's changing so quickly. And sometimes people say, let's put the brakes on. Let's let's consolidate our, our strengths and, and go for it. Hey, a few anti-patterns. These are things like if you see them, you gotta you gotta be worried. Okay. Um, I'm not saying they're kisses of death, but they're causes, they're red flags, they're causes for concern. Um, perhaps the most classic one. Bunch of folks, bunch of friends say, hey, let's do a startup. Great. And do a startup together. Awesome. This will be fantastic. Each of us get equal equity and uh, we'll all hop in full time as soon as the money's here. Um, this person right now isn't working, so they'll start full time and the others will join once there's enough revenue flow. Sounds great. Big problem if there's no written partnership agreement and no dispute management. There's got to be enough framework legally um, to make sure that people are on the same page, that there's written documentation. Everyone said, yeah, we're splitting the equity when it was five of us, now it was six of us or four of us. Because that may get disputed later. Um, I've seen people go to court when they say, well, wait a minute, I was promised at that meeting on this certain date, I was promised 20%. And the partner said, no, I never did. Maybe we, you know, if it was an idea, but, but we never agreed to that. Well, we agreed to with 10%. I said, no, I'm sure. You know, remember it was that time you went out to dinner and it was right after that. And I said, no, you know, show, show us the agreement. Oh, no, there's no agreement. Um, um, there was a case where I actually had the notes from that meeting, where it said 20%. And, and those notes served as legal documentation for that. But the point is, you need an agreement in place. You need it, and perhaps most importantly, you need a dispute management program. If it goes to court, there's a problem. There's a missed opportunity. There should be a dispute management plan that's tiered. What I mean by tiered is not tiers. Uh, as often comes from these things, but but tiered in the sense that it's escalated. So first you agree to you know to mediation. So you have a third party mediator. First you agree to meet with the people you disagree with. That often requires a certain amount of courage, right? You, you meet with these people that are claiming, I'm claiming this, you're claiming that. Okay, you gotta meet together and then you have a mediation, and then you have arbitration. Arbitration is different. Arbitration is binding. Mediation is often, you know, try to get the parties to come to agreement, try to use the skills in settling disputes to bring this thing home through powers of moral suasion and, and persuasion. Um, arbitration is can often be binding. It's like, okay, I'll arbitrate this. You have to agree that if I arbitrate this, you'll you'll agree to whatever you know uh, outcome. I recommend you, you agree on a third party, a neutral third party. And only then go to litigation. Litigation turns up tons of money. By litigation, you mean like lawsuit, like court. You bring people to court. At that point, it's often too late. And I've seen too many cases end up in court. Um, gross inequity and partner commitments. This is a big thing, and risk exposure. This, you know, you say, okay, great. We're starting this startup with four people. Awesome. We're going to have equal equity division. Sounds equal. Great. Again, one of us um, doesn't isn't holding down a job. They recently left the job. They're kind of sick. They worked as a code monkey, and they'll do this full time. And the other three will come on board when the revenue is up. That may sound equal. It ain't equal. Why? Because there's much greater risk exposure on the part of the person who's not working at startup. They're working for the startup full time without making a salary externally. 
And they are suffering a lot of risk. They have a hole in their resume, which if the startup goes under, they may be embarrassed. Um, they have a, uh, a loss of income. They're not getting paid. Um, the others are getting paid still by their existing company. And that risk exposure merits more equity. Equity should follow risk exposure in general. So if someone's working full time and three others are working part time, it's not equitable that they all get the same exact equity state. Someone's taking a lot more work. They're, they're building the company in a more foundational way than the people who are still working. So they need more, more equity, more share of the company. You know, twenty percent. I own twenty percent of the company, um, or what? What does that really mean? Right? We'll get to financing, but one of the things it means is, you know, if the company sold, I get twenty percent of. Come on. Right? Um, if shares are issued, and typically they are, there's different classes of shares and so on. I own twenty percent of the shares. Um, and there's some differences here with vesting and so on, but. But basically, it's uh, how much of the shares or how much of the company do you own? What fraction of the company? Um, I mentioned this issue of part time partners with kind of fuzzy plans when they'll come online. Yeah, I'll come online eventually. I'll join you as soon as the, the money is sufficient or as soon as we have our first client. And it never comes about. You know? And you see here all sorts of excuses for that. You, know? you hear the partner say, like, you know, I'm in this job right now, and it really helps the company that I'm working full time for this other firm because it lets me spot market prospects, or it lets me know what tools we should use, or I can use these tools from work to help um, that otherwise we need to buy licenses for. There are all sorts of excuses that people make for not coming on board full time. Yeah, what is there a risk legally if you're working for another company and your body uh, yes. Yeah. Thing. Yes, okay. there is. Yeah, it's just I'm listing types of reasons people give. They shouldn't do that. They shouldn't use the licenses for work software or to develop for this small startup either. Um, they shouldn't be cultivating prospects, customers for this other company um, in the in the course of their business dealings for their main employer. And you know, one of the the big steps you should ask is if you went before your existing employer and you said, you know, I've been contacting these customers for you and, and linking them up with a startup, even if it's not directly competitive, it's not directly competing, but it's another business, would the company be happy? Very unlikely, right? Because <laughs> it's kind of unprofessional activity, right? But people do it, and I've heard these sort of excuses before. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, project management. If, if you have someone who's not experienced project manager, you know, um, who's who's running the show technically, that could be an issue. Um, I'll just leave it at, at that. Um, uh, and if you're entering markets that you don't really know, you know, if if your team, so the team for missing kids, decide you're going to sell to the police market. Or the team for you know building the software for childcare centers said we're going to sell to nutritionists. That's great. I, I don't want you to discourage that, but you have to like immerse yourself in that market. You have to learn everything there is to know about you know how nutritionists work and what sort of studies they run and you know how many do these plate waste studies this way versus that way. You gotta like immerse yourself in it. You can't think like, oh, I basically know what the issues are here. You need to surround yourself with people who can give you really good understanding of that. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. For the gross and the equity and partner commitment. Yeah. Risk exposure. Yeah. So I wanna uh, ask for your experience. Like, uh, in my opinion, if someone's part time and like saying, oh, I don't want to commit to full time, right? They're not exposing as much risk because, like, Precisely. they're still 
like being safe just in case it doesn't fail. And if it fails, if it succeeds, they'll just go on. So I don't think they should get any equity at all. I don't know. In your experience, if people would get equity as part they of They generally get some equity, but it's very small. And when we come to discuss financing, this will come up as issues again. Venture capitalists or angel investors who are different types of investors, okay? Angels typically invest kind of their own or family money. Uh, venture capitalists invest company money um, uh, and, and sometimes market money. Um, they will, they look very poorly at this issue of people who are kind of part-time and they might own equity, but it's less than 10% and often less than 5%, like 5% or less. Where it becomes a big issue is if you, I have to say, academics are, are, are a problem for this sometimes. So an academic says, wow, great idea. I'm going to found a company with students, great. And so they go find a company with students and you know, the professor earns, has 25% of the company. If VC sees that, and the professor's just working full time in the professorial position, I'll say, oh, come on, you can't be serious. Like this, this professor is, is like working full time in this, it, it, or her existing position and on 25% of this company, no way. 5%, yeah, maybe that's about right. Below 10%. Anything about that is embarrassing. And it reflects a failure to really value how much people are contributing, okay? You can have people, like why 5%, why not zero? Because they're contributing something substantive. Like maybe the maybe this person who isn't leaving the job knows all about the nutrition market. Maybe they're a professor of nutrition and they'll clue you in so all these, you know, different types of needs of how people, how people study things in child care centers involving, you know, use of food or use other types of food related consumption studies. They're adding a lot of intellectual value, but they're not shouldering the risk. And so typically they get a small fraction of equity because they are contributing, but they're not, uh, they're not, you know, uh, uh, bearing equal risk. Uh, but Brampton, were you going to ask something more? Uh, I mean, like, if they, I don't know, if, I, I don't know, like, if they say, like, if they're working part time and part time somewhere else, that's already a risk because they're not confident in the yeah. company. Yeah, that's, that, it is, it's a bit of a risk. Yes. Um, how do we know that they'll still be able to contribute three months from now, right? Maybe they'll be so caught up. Maybe they'll be seconded by the pandemic for the pandemic and you know we'll run modeling for the province for 13 months. Um, how do we know they can continue to contribute? This is a, a real issue and and that has to be factored in. And at the same time, they may be delivering value now. You need to you need to tune these mechanisms, as we'll see with the equity. One of the things people generally do is it's not a matter they just say, you have five percent equity. They say um, first of all, you choose, like, do you want to be paid per hour? Okay. Um, or do you want to be paid equity, but it only vests over time? So you have this nominal equity, maybe it's 5%, which is kind of allocated to you, but it's only over time you actually earn that. Okay. And so if you contribute over the course of three years, by the end of the three years, you'll own 5% of the company. And if you leave early, all the equity goes away, for example. And so they have what's called a cliff, a vesting cliff. And if you leave before that, you lose it all. Um, and that keeps people engaged who might otherwise just say, well, you know, I'm busy now with another startup. Sorry, I don't have time for you. Well, guess what? Their equity disappears. So it keeps them engaged on an ongoing basis. And this is typical. Like, when you start at a startup uh, as one of the first couple dozen people, maybe they'll give you a share of equity, but then as a vesting requirement, you have to be there for a couple of years to really earn it. They don't want people to like swoop in and get 1% of the company and then hop off and go to another company, right? There's a vesting requirement uh, for it. Um, you can also get stock options, options to buy the stock at the day you started if the company's already gone through IPO, et cetera. 
but I, I, I'm not going to that uh, at this. Um, other other questions. This is this is great. I really value these questions. Okay. Um, let's let's get here to the thing. Um, divergent visions among partners is a big issue. Maybe you see it in your own projects. Maybe some people in the project say we should really do this, and other people. Um, let's just stick to the, let's just stick to a, a narrower vision that we're sure. Um, uh, there's often tensions between what people want. People have had ideas or they'll have, you know, dreams of, of doing a certain thing and think, wouldn't it be cool to do it this way? Or we should try that market, which is nearby. It'd be so easy to adapt it and others caution against it. And often these tensions come out in the product direction, et cetera. Um, financing, if you get financing, um, Bay Area VCs are, are known for this, um, you know, it can be quite controlled. If you give up more than half of your equity, your chances are you can be controlled pretty tightly by personnel they, they appoint. Um, I, I talked earlier about business plans that sort of flap around. It's infinitely flexible. I've seen many, many companies, they have an idea and just where they go is just totally different. And often, you know, it's sacrificed uh, their, some of their core, core original intellectual uh, insights uh, associated with it. Um, yeah, um, another thing is desperation driven sales. Oh man, oh, this is a sad thing. Seen startups go under. Good startups, thoughtful startups, startups where a lot of great work had been done, some great technical work, and they went under needlessly. Why? They were desperate for sales. They were desperate for their first one. What does that lead them to do? Leads them to accept, accept the first client at a low price. What is that low price? Mean? They can't pay their technical control of their work. Guess what happens at technical people? The technical people they like more and more. Technical people leave. The startup can't deliver on what they told the client. The startup is unable to deliver or be set by bugs that they can't fix because they don't have the technical people to fix them. And the startup is embarrassed with its first client. The startup is unable to deliver effectively for its first client because they don't have the technical talent anymore. To walk because they can't get paid because they sold it for too little. And the startup goes under and it's sold after four years of sold. They finally found a great first client, big name first client. They got their dream client and they sold it for too little and everything sold. Then it happened. A lot of reach. A lot of reach. Um, missed opportunity. So desperation driven sales. Yeah, you want to make that sale. First big client, but you sacrifice. The, it's like eating your seed corn. You sacrifice what keeps you alive because it's the technical time. Not the kids of death. I mean, okay, so you make your first sale. What do you do? Go get finance. First company invested, you know, sold to you. Okay, we'll be willing to lend you, you know, for modest interest rate, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You pay your technical folks really well, and you keep them, and you keep them happy, and you deliver for that client really well, and then you get your second client, your third client, your fourth client, and it builds from there. If if you don't do that, you know, it can all fall apart, and I've seen it. Um, uh, okay, I've talked about partners. Um, so, look, when it comes to software, software startups, as computer scientists, a lot of our thinking actually goes to the software software. Software as a service, issues of multi platform systems. You know, you folks are working with different ones, right? Flutter versus React Native and, and Selling things from multiple, you know, mobile devices and having server side, you know, serverless solutions and you know authentication mechanisms and and billing mechanisms, etc. There's all sorts of technical stuff there that's great. 
Um, but there's a lot more to it. And there's a lot more that's really substantive. And if you work in a startup, you start to learn these things, but no one else is going to do it for you. You start to learn about sales and it's different from marketing. Marketing is getting the word out, promoting the product, letting people know that it's available, making sure they know it's there. Sales is about closing the deal. And often the marketing people hate the sales. And they really don't like it. But the marketing folks want to, they're, they're different incentives. The, the marketing folks can promise all the world about what's going to be sold. And the sales folks, they want to close the deal. And they want to promise as little as possible. And so one of the most famous cases of this was IBM back in like the 80s and 90s and before. IBM would, would try to sell assistance. And you get the marketing folks in there talking it up and saying, oh, you did all these great things. And so then the sales people come in and it's like, ah, you can't do anything. You know, you can do it with this. And, you want, you want to do that? Yeah, well, you pay twice as much or three times as much. And it's kind of this whiplash on the part of customers. This is very real stuff. So marketing sales, which we kind of think in computer science, I don't know, it's like, you know, in physics, you talk about a point source. It's like, it's actually, you know, um, uh, it's a car. If you see it up close, but if you view it from five miles away, it looks like it's stuff, right? It's a successful point. And sales and marketing seem kind of like, oh, it's the same sort of financial stuff of getting people to buy it. You know, you kind of wave your hands and say it's the same thing. It ain't the same thing. They're different. They're different incentives, different people, different people marketing, like succeed at one of these or other. Sales people are different types of people that deal with marketing. So. And you got to respect that. Like the people you turn to for marketing don't turn to your sales folks. They're, they're different and different. Types of sales are done for different types of problems. Legal has its own thing. I know people hate to talk about law, hate to read the end user license agreement, hate to go through the fine print, you know, um, indemnify and hold harmless, you know, the party of a third party is the party of a third party, and, and all these sorts of wording. I actually rather like legal text. It's kind of interesting. Um, my colleague, uh, Eric Neufeld, argues good legal documents are like algorithms. They're actually really tightly written and stuff like that. They're like good, good algorithms. Anyway, it's an interesting uh, point. Um, business plan and financial side is, is a whole thing, like the business model you use. There's, there's a whole logic to it, structure to it. There's structure to all of these. There's kind of an orderliness, a regularness to them. Managerial side, uh, like how to how to handle uh, different levels of, of hierarchy, matrix organizations versus trade line organizations, etc. Where you have two bosses versus one boss, um, and you know human resources, office space, and, and technical side. Um, uh, I will say that incubators. Anyone know an incubator here? It's actually a quite famous one located within under the car. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, that's the collab right, right up uh, the street at an innovative place. It's a great place. They have co working space, you can go in there and, and uh, you know, stay at um, use a, a set of uh, space and tables. They can promote your company some with, with uh, information and pamphlets there. They also will bring in folks like most incubators will have shared resources. So they'll have, you know, the internet that internet connections. They may have, you know, things like photocopier printers, all that sort of IT stuff, but then they'll also have, you know, folks who are marketing experts that they, they contract with as a incubator to give advice on marketing to any client or for sales, and they can help you, you know, get sales out. Or they have legal people they can give you legal advice, write your first contracts for your first customers. They can have someone who's the secretary for your company. So when customers call, they don't get the developer directly. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, you know, look at the secretary. And 
that secretary will answer it and say the name of your company. So it sounds like you have a custom secretary. Actually, it's one secretary for like 10 companies. They just have different lines and they know what to say, you know, for each one. And they'll take the messages and pass it on and then it's a schedule or whatever. Um, you have a boardroom, right, where you can meet with clients and they'll say, oh, wow, this is a great place, you know. Um, wow, it's nice, nice that you can do presentations to them in your boardroom and and it, but it's shared. It's an incubator board. So incubators are, are great places. And I've, I've made use of a couple of incubator spaces over my time with small companies. And there are some right here in town, like Collabs. There are also co working spaces that are have some elements of this, like downtown. I think it's uh, 220 on 20th Ave or what have you, or 320, um, et cetera. Incubators are really great spaces for starting a company without paying through the nose for each for expertise in each of these areas. But the thing you need to know, the thing I wish I had known when I started this out, like there are structured best practices, knowledge bases, bodies of knowledge for each of these areas. There's 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 a logic to each of these areas that's different. And Part of going into startups successfully is having the networking to tap into people who are experts in each of these areas, get the requisite advice. Incubators help a lot, but having that network to other companies or other firms, et cetera, can really aid you. Um, you can you can get started a lot more easily and avoid certain tripping up in certain areas. Um, Okay, um, we're really running out of time here for today, but I'll just say that when we talk about software startups, as I alluded to earlier, you know, there's this diversity of, of software startups. Software startups are not all the same. They're actually quite different, and we can divide them in a couple different ways. The problem, this is important, there's, you know, when we think about software startups, maybe your minds go to Twitter. Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, you know, um, uh, any number of, of these larger, larger firms. Um, these firms are large scale growth that have, have um, high market sales and they sell different things. You know, some are services, they provide services, some are products, et cetera. But we can distinguish those from other ones it can be very successful where large scale growth is not sought. So this is class that can just grow, grow, grow exponentially when they're successful. And then there's a set that are self limiting, but still very successful. Sole proprietorship, small scale consultancy, and contract software shops. There's a lot of those in town too. You know, I could put a number here in town in each of these bins. Um, and these ones may, you know, the, the founders may be doing really well. They may make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on their startup and so on. But the startups can always stay in the range of maybe low millions of dollars of valuation. These startups might go into hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? They're super successful into billions of dollars. There's, you know, there's, there's uh, huge markets out there they can tap into. Whereas these ones tend to be, you know, smaller scale, growth is not seen, but they can be very successful. And it's worth reflecting on that. You can have great success, do very well financially for yourself, um, be your own boss, um, you know, implement your own dreams and so on with large scale, small scale companies as well as large scale. Not every startup, software startup is of this sort. Just they tend to dominate the news, right? Because they're the ones who are people who are found in are billionaires. Here, you might be a millionaire for the large scale growth. You won't be a billionaire, but you may do very well. Just be aware that's always a problem. And guess which of these is more risky? Anyone? Which of them is more risky? The large scale. Yeah, the large scale is more risky. It's actually more risks associated with large scale. Uh, you know, you tend to. You know, risk and return, right? High risk, high return. Low risk, comparatively lower return, but it's really well. 
This one would be like, you know, small companies, companies that do that do uh, consulting services, sell contracts um, uh, around the province, around Canada, or what have you. They, they do really well. They have customers that purchase their systems for hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of pop. Um, they're not seeking to grow like any clusters, but they do very well. Um, they they uh, have good customer, loyal customer bases, large scale, you're selling to more and more and more, you're diversifying your product lines, you're growing into new markets, you have new products, all sorts of stuff going on, right? Um, quite different. The other category we'll distinguish here, and then I'll finish, is, is according to kind of dimensions of business models. Are you selling a product or are you selling a service? And you can kind of blur the two a little bit, but you know, are you selling something that people purchase and use as kind of a discrete thing? You're selling an always on sort of service that just services the needs when it comes up. Um, uh, target markets are you targeting individuals or are you targeting enterprises, institutions? Are you selling to you know, institutions that will pay a hundred thousand dollars? Because they can afford it for tens of thousands. Are you selling to individual people? You know, want to buy an app for ten cents? Different markets, right? You've got to reach a lot more people for individuals. Selling to enterprises or institutions, but focus in on those institutions. Maybe you're selling to dental offices. You need to know everything there is to know about dental offices or nutritionists or whatever. Um, you 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 sell to a, a smaller set. And is it kind of a mass market or a niche market? Uh, are you selling Candy Crush um, uh, to you know uh, to all consumers, or are you selling to uh, in a niche market for dental customers, the software to manage you know their finances or something like that, and do billing to to reimbursement from reimbursement? Um, I guess you could be a follower or leader in this area. And what's your growth model? Are you seeking to scale up? Are you seeking to do semi-customizing of your product? Same basic product, but you customize it. You own the intellectual property as a company, but you customize it, and they have a non-exclusive, non-exclusive in perpetuity license for unlimited use, but you keep the intellectual property. They can use it and get full value out of it, but you can keep on customizing it for other customers. Very attractive model. Or are you um, growing targeted areas of business and other areas that sort of target different mar market vertical segments, for example? Okay, we'll come back to this, but the basic issue is software startups are not all the same. They are different in terms of quite a few dimensions, large scale, you know high growth uh, and sort of broad growth versus small growth and whether it's uh, distinguished by you know who it's selling it to products services growth models etc okay we'll 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 come back to this but there's a set of um strategies on and selling strategies and pricing strategies that address some of these needs subscription software as a service semi custom etc We'll talk about that next time. And we'll also next time wrap up some closing thoughts for the course. Okay. Um, so that'll be next time. Um, I look forward to meeting those people that I've contacted um, and discussing ways to ensure your contributions to ID5. And I look forward to seeing you on, on Thursday. I know this is a high pressure week for you. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your teams come together and uh, to a successful ID talk. Okay. Thank you very much.